Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Michelle. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you, Michael? I'm doing fantastic too. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, really great to have you here. And I'm really looking forward to your story because, of course, I've read a little bit about you on your website and your bio. And there's some kindred spirit things going on, like minded stuff. So um, hopefully, we'll have a fabulous discussion. I start with kind of a very open question, Michelle, and you, you can take it as far as you would like to. So tell us and the listeners and myself and everything that happened in your life today, you know, what's your story and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, yeah. The good, bad and the indifferent, right? So yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll just start right in and dive right in. So uh, I was I was born in a small town in North Idaho, so the uh, the northwest of the United States. And I grew up to amazing parents. My mom and my dad were my biggest cheerleaders, and I've got a younger brother as well. And growing yeah. up, my daddy was military, and we moved around a lot. And uh, we ended up in Idaho, back in Idaho, uh, after moving to Hawaii and Vermont and Arizona. And, wow. Uh, and I, uh, I was about 16 years old when I was like, hey, I want a real job. <laughs> and <laughs> that, my mom was uh, working in a restaurant. She was managing a restaurant, and she said that she'd train me. So I worked my way from hostess to server and bartender and all this. And I love the restaurant industry. I actually spent well over 15 years in the restaurant industry, cumulative. But wow, yeah. uh, when I was about 18, 19 years old, I wanted something even more. And when mm. I was that young, that something even more was to move to Hollywood, California to become a movie star. Oh, <laughs> so that's what I did. Yeah. So I packed up my things and I drove my happy little butt from North Idaho all the way down to California and things were great you know the glamour the glitz I was starring in independent plays and films oh and, great uh, and then I ended up meeting somebody this uh this man who I be I thought was going to be my prince charming mm. and lo and behold about four months into that relationship was the first sign of physical violence and I remember I had, um, he had backed me into a wall and uh, had pushed me so hard against it that my head actually went through the wall. And I didn't realize that this was the beginning stages of domestic violence. See, I never grew up with family members who had domestic violence. My, mm. my mom and my dad never yelled at each other. My, my parents never lifted their hand to one another. So when yeah. I was going through that, I, I, I couldn't comprehend what I was going through. So I just, I ended up staying with, with Paul, my abuser for four years. And during wow. those four years, it was a lot of psychological manipulation, physical violence. I was beat multiple times um, for over four hours, sexual abuse, uh, financial abuse, something that a lot of people don't talk about is the financial abuse aspect. Mm -hmm. And um, when I finally escaped that relationship, I sat in front of my computer, very similar to what you and I are doing now on our computers. And I began to document things that happened to me, just began to write. And when I started to write, it first came out in a play format with my theater background. And in 2016, I wrote and performed a 65 minute solo play about my experience in domestic violence. And then people started coming up to me and then telling me their stories, their mom's stories, sister, brother, neighbor's stories of domestic violence. Mm. And I knew that I had to do something even more in my life yet again. And that something even more was uh, I started a nonprofit organization in 2017 called Unsilenced Voices. We began in West Africa. So we began in Ghana and Sierra Leone. In 2020, we expanded to Rwanda. In 2022, this year, we expanded to the United States with a five city tour across the US. And uh, we also provide grants and subsidiaries to survivors of domestic violence they could use for transportation, relocation, childcare, you name it. And then in 2019, I published my first book called But I Love Him, which is my experience in DV. And I began uh, speaking worldwide. So 
March of 2020, I actually got stuck in Egypt and, and London. Uh, I was stuck at Heathrow and then Gatwick for over 47 hours, 49 hours. Wow. That. And, um, and I have been speaking on podcasts and, and live audiences now. I've probably spoken to well over 150 digital audiences. And uh, I want to say roughly 60, 70 live audiences. Uh, and I talk a lot about turning your story into your legacy and, and not allowing your circumstances to define who you are because it's a choice. What we've gone through, maybe that wasn't the choice, but how we react to what we've gone through is a choice. So yes. I teach that and talk a lot about that as well. So that's kind of me in a nutshell, a long-winded answer, Michael, but there you go. <laughs> no, it's it's great. Thank you. I, I'm so sorry you went through what you had to go through. I no. I know that the consequence of it means that you can help a lot more women or and men that are, you know, survivors or even, you know, victims at the moment. And I think yeah, that's really important. I like to say that God turns broken things into beautiful things, mm. broken things into beautiful things. Um, I would never wish this upon anybody. However, no. because of what I went through, I do now get to help thousands of people, men, women, and children across yes. four countries right now and speaking on different stages digital stages in london and and different parts of the uk and different parts of europe and australia and it's it's really great you know being able to share because so many people have gone through this yeah i know and i always say to to people that are close to me who've experienced this too i i and the more stories that are seem to be coming out every single day these days. And in some respects, it is good because people have the courage to now speak about it. Um, I am saddened, you know, because and I at times I genuinely say this with, you know, respect and say I'm sometimes embarrassed to be a man um, because Although I know women can be guilty of it too, the majority of cases are still men. And yeah, it's it's bad news for, for guys, I think, to, to have that reputation. And yes, um, most of the survivors and victims that you deal with and speak to are females. That means that yes. the culprit are primarily men. However, I have talked to a lot of men, especially here in the United States, who their wives and girlfriends have beat them, spit on them, slapped them. Domestic violence, you know, women are also the, the perpetrators. And yeah. you have to remember that domestic violence isn't a women's issue, it's a human rights issue. And uh, LGBTQIA men and women and children all experience domestic violence. Yes, the, the proportions are, are heavily weighed towards the women, but uh, yeah. I, I definitely do and have met many men who've experienced violence. And typically the guys don't realize that it's domestic violence. You know, they get slapped in the face or pushed or, or hit and slapped a few times and spit on and they, they don't tend to, Michael, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but you don't tend to go to the police and say, hey, my girlfriend's beating me up. Mm. It's not viewed in society as something that is acceptable. So mm. a lot of men just deal with it, right? Yeah. But women, when women go to the police and say, my husband's beating me up, it's a big deal. Yeah. So we have to remember <clears throat> that it takes two to tango. Yes. And and that's in a good and a bad relationship. So a healthy and an unhealthy relationship. So mm. it's all about how do we create those healthy relationships dealing with our own personal issues underneath because there's always an underlying reason why abuse happens. So my abuser has had multiple things happen in his uh, youth and yeah. I heard a statistic. So uh, Unsilenced Voices did an event in Dallas, and then we just uh, did an event in Vegas. And between 40 to 76% of children who experience domestic violence in the home 
will actually become abusers or the abused. And I mm -hmm. say 40 to 76 because 40% was the Dallas statistic and 76% was the Las Vegas statistic. So even if it's someplace in between, that's well over 50% of the kids experiencing domestic yeah. violence. And the thing is, is if they grow up witnessing that and seeing that, then they think that that is normal. And that's the same worldwide. We deal with a lot of children and families in Sierra Leone and Ghana. And, and in particularly, I remember going into a, a household when I, was, when I was in Ghana last year. And on, uh, on the television, it was a, a cartoon dealing with um, devaluing women. So yes. it was all about um, how men are superior, how women need to listen, how, um, you know, even in the, in the cartoon, there was verbal abuse happening to this woman. And it made me think that the cultural beliefs need to be shifted, right? We need to educate people about morals and values and what's right and wrong um, and shift out of the mentality that it's okay to be mean or aggressive because once these kids grow up and they, they experience all of this, then they're either going to be the abusers or the abused. Hundred percent, and I think that yeah, what you're talking about, if I'm not mistaken, is like the conditioned mind. Yeah, and it's very, very difficult to change the conditioned mind. I mean, I remember as a kid, I I didn't know it was domestic violence, but my father was violent in the household mm -hmm. towards my mother. You know, if he got angry, he would, I would never see him hurt her right but the shouting was there the throwing the whiskey glass to the against the wall what happened hitting his fist so hard on a glass table that the glass of the was like a top on the table the glass just cracked and yeah it scared me it scared all the kids you know and but that kind of level of violence that you see in the household, you, you never relate back to maybe issues that you could have in later mm -hmm. life. It's, yeah. you know, it's crazy. Uh, a lot of the people listening to podcasts are uh, business professionals or people wanting to learn even more um, uh, about their personal lives and professional lives and yes. entrepreneurs, right? There's yes. a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to podcasts and 50% of entrepreneurs deal with a mental health condition. And the reason wow. why it's so high is because of these early childhood experiences that we've had that mm. we have brushed off thinking, Hey, we're fine. Right. It's, it's yeah. all good. But if we don't feel through issues, feel through pain, feel through our experiences, then it comes out in autoimmune disorders, chronic fatigue, anxiety, stress, uh, obesity, you name it. Yeah. There's all kinds of things that happen because we are actually not dealing with our past issues. So yes, yeah, I mean, you are, you are hundred percent right when you say that there's a lot of adults walking around with baggage, lots and yeah. lots of pain. And mm. in order for us to live in a happy world, we have to not only help the victims and survivors, but we also have to realize that typically the abusers are victims themselves. And yeah. it's how, how, we, how we can help them, um, transition them, rehabilitate as well, you know, and that's mm. the hard part. That's it has to be the hardest part because they in the first instance, have to see, you know, a little bit of light that suggests that they have an issue going on that they're yeah. not aware of. And that's pretty tough to be able to identify that. If you're not self, if you're not self-reflecting and, you know, if you don't look in the mirror and kind of go, what am I doing? You know, I need help. <laughs> it's, it's very tough for people to turn around and do that. And very, very, very tough for people to actually ask for help. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And the first stage, so I teach a five-step process to help people overcome challenges. And that first stage is uh, recognize. Because even the, the first stage in any 12-step program is you first have to identify and realize and recognize what it is that you're going through. 
Yes. So that first stage is the hardest part. So it's sitting down and actually getting really clear about what it is that you've gone through in your life and how it's affecting you. Mm. Yeah. 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 And what I, I think the other question, if you don't mind, just as dwelling on this topic, because I think it's so important. It, it needs airtime more and more. I I am getting braver that if I see anybody doing something or even language, you know, I mean, for the last past two years, obviously, we've all been stuck away from people. But I've even noticed, you know, when you go to, say, business networking events and you meet lots of entrepreneurs and business people and there's men and women there, men may say certain things about women in the room, right? And I've been uncomfortable with some of the things that they've mentioned. And in past years, years gone by, you kind of go, oh, yeah, ha, 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 that's very funny. But there could be underlying things that are going on that you don't, you're not aware of. <clears throat> and I have become a tiny, I wouldn't say I'm 100% braver, but I'm a tiny bit braver where I did this to a family member a few years back and I noticed the way he was speaking to his girlfriend. And I said, that's not acceptable. The way you speak to your girlfriend that way is not acceptable. I mean, he got very aggressive with me as a result of it, but I am getting braver to kind of speak out to other men to say, that's not acceptable anymore. Or that's what, what you're saying need. yeah we definitely need that we need uh mm. we need guys to say hey bro that's not cool right and mm. i think uh the dynamic is shifting quicker in the united states than it is in other countries mm. um you definitely see a lot of men um there's retaliation happening to men in the u.s and unfortunately we're also demasculating men that's an entirely other conversation yeah uh, we need to stop doing that but as far as domestic violence and violence in particular a lot of men right now are standing up like yourself Michael and saying hey mm. bro don't talk to your girlfriend like that you know don't hit your girlfriend don't don't um spit on your girlfriend things like that right mm. don't do that stuff don't don't hurt your wife um and I think that slowly but surely it's going to become more acceptable for pedestrians like ourselves just the nor ordinary public that witness that to step in and say yeah. something do something um yeah. it's the same thing for women too you know women if you're if you're out there listening to me and you talk down to your husband or talk down to your your boyfriend and you verbally abuse them stop doing that too you know yeah uh, and it's up to us women to say the same thing so it's, uh, like I said in the beginning, it's, it's human rights and it respect, you know, the one commonality that all religions have across all spheres, right? Yes. Is love. Love is the number one commonality. Mm. So if you treat somebody poorly, think about somebody treating you the same way. Do you yeah. want that? No. You know, and it's also the same self-talk. You talk negative about yourself. Would you want somebody else talking that bad about you? So we've got to get to a place where we love ourselves and love the people around us. And that's going to yes. take some time. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And then we have, I'm, I'm interested in your view on a very recent event, which is the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard case. I'm sorry to do this to you. That's um, okay. I'll, I'll answer what I feel comfortable with. <clears throat> okay. And so lots of well uh, family members <laughs> close to me were going yay johnny depp's one you know and i didn't say anything because i didn't want to cause an argument in the family or anything like that but i felt uncomfortable with that and the kind of I don't know. Nobody knows what actually went on. There's some video footage. You know, we just don't know what went on. 
we have no idea. I didn't see all of the testimonies. I didn't see the live feeds or anything like that. But my inclination, even as a guy, would go on the side of the woman. And that's just my personal <laughs> view. But here in this country and the press and the media were talking, that's it now. You know, women don't feel they have a voice anymore after that case. This, this means they will not come forward and raise issues of domestic violence that they're experiencing because they go, well, it's not going to happen. You know, no one's going to take us seriously anymore. What's your so, view, Michelle? Well, oh, that's a very loaded question. First, I'm going to answer in regards to how I feel their relationship was. Now, mm. do I think that Johnny Depp is the culprit? Not exactly. Do I think that Amber Heard is? I think that it was two-sided for sure. Right. Um, the reason why a lot of women don't feel like that they can speak out anymore is because they feel like that Johnny Depp was the abuser and that Amber Heard was the victim. However, with testimony, with other people's information, I personally feel that it took two of them. So that means I definitely think that Amber Heard physically and emotionally abused Johnny Depp and vice versa. Now, wow. the fact that women feel that they can't come out and speak, this could be, this could be an issue from underlying conditions, meaning that it's almost an excuse for a woman not to speak up now. It's very scary to go to the police. It's very scary yeah. to talk about your abusive relationship. It's very scary when people don't believe you, right? Mm. Extremely scary. But they, I feel, are using this as an excuse not to speak up. Right. And I think that when you are strong in your beliefs, strong in knowing the truth, speaking up no matter what is what is important. Yeah. So I know that that's a kind of a roundabout way to answer that. Um, no, but I think I, that's I, fair. I, yeah, I, I just, I don't personally think that it was all Johnny. And uh, I do think that Amber definitely had, had her hand in it as well. Thank you. I think that's fair uh, because, you know, they they both got some awards, didn't they, out of it all? Um, and, well, the, there was a case, you probably know, there was a case that happened in the United Kingdom around a newspaper where he the newspaper printed something to say that he was a wife beater. And he took them to court, the newspaper, mm. and he lost that case. Because it was he lost that it's defamation. Yeah, it was presided over by a judge rather than a jury. I think that was the difference from what I read. Mm. And the judge had felt there was enough evidence from Amber to, you know, to to dismiss the case basically, or to, or to yeah to say he was guilty. But yeah. Anyway. I mean, we're not experts in the law. I'm certainly not an expert. It just was such a public case. Uh, it's probably been the biggest event, I believe, after Me Too, in terms of publicity um, around the topic. Whereas, you know, the Me Too campaign was very, I believe, positive um, in terms yes, of... Yes, you and I disagree about that. I do not... Okay was positive whatsoever uh this oh, is okay. where, we, where we began to demasculize men this is also where we be, we began to see that um women were lying a lot of women were lying and unfortunately it hurt a lot of our ability to move forward so the pendulum was too far this direction 100 okay. percent i agree with that right but unfortunately with Me Too, it moved too far the other direction. 
Right. So now a lot of women's rights are being taken away from us slowly but surely right underneath our noses. And it's because of the fear, right? The fear of what us women can do to, to men. Yes. And, and we have, in a sense, demasculized men. We, we expect as women to be paid the same amount of money, to be given the same amount of respect, but first dates, we want the man to open our door and to pay for our dinners and to take us out and to wine and dine us. Me, yes. myself, I love to be wine and dined. I want, I want my, my husband, my boyfriend to, to be a gentleman. I'm kind of old school per se like yes. that. However, if we want to keep that old school mentality, we have to uplift the men who are doing that. And now men are are scared to even touch your shoulder or open a door for you. There's been many instances where I've heard, uh, I've got a lot of guy friends who, you know, they open a door and the woman's like, what are you doing, right? And I don't think that we know yet what is happening with our identities. And I think right. that this is definitely causing us to question some things about our identities and, about you know roles masculine and feminine roles and what that looks like these days so so me too the beginning the idea of it was amazing however yeah. the result of it is not okay thank you for that distinction i hadn't seen it that way and yeah you're you're 100 right that's not a good place for us all to be we've got to get a balance back to this yeah. which means, you know, we come from a place of love and respect. That's definitely right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Oh, wow. <laughs> and in, when you're on your travels and speaking and appearing different places and audiences, how, how is it received, you know, and what essentially are you presenting to people? So I, uh, I talk a lot about overcoming challenges. So I talk a lot about right. overcoming the traumas that we've been through. So I don't only talk about domestic violence issues, right. but I talk a lot about all issues. We've all experienced some kind of trauma, yes. whether it is hardcore trauma like child abuse and domestic violence, sexual violence, or if the trauma is neglect issues, the trauma could be um, deaths in the family, there's so many different types of trauma that has affected us. Yes. So it's how do we overcome those traumas and live our fullest life? So that's typically what I talk about. I don't dive into politics. I definitely don't dive into uh, opinion about things that are not really my business or that I don't know much about. I have opinions, yes. So if I'm asked those opinions, like you've asked me, Michael, a few things, yes. I will voice what, what I believe. Mm. However, that, that does not discredit somebody else's belief system. Something that has happened in our societies in you know, the Western world and the Eastern world and all the way around, right? Is there's division, there's huge division. Yes. And the, the, the number one thing that, so I've got, let me back up a minute. One of my very good friends, his name is George Chanos. He is the former attorney general of the state of Nevada. He wrote a book called Millennial Samurai. In this book, they, uh, he talks about the things that you need for the 21st century in order for us to live our happy lives. And the one, number one most important thing that we need is empathy. And unfortunately, we don't have empathy with one another. We mm. are so, so divided that when one person disagrees with another, there cannot be an open conversation anymore. Yes. They all of a sudden get cut off. But the reason, the thing that makes us human beings is having our own opinions and actually what makes you even more intelligent is when you get the opinions of people that you don't necessarily agree with. Don't get in a fight with them. Listen to why they believe that way. Yes. But I think that's so important. I talk a lot about empathy on stage and about how we need to be open to one another and how we, we need to really realize that the more divided we become, we then 
are becoming less. And mm. I don't exactly know how to say that, except for human beings are not the same as we used to be. We don't come together. We don't help one another. Um, I mean, look at all these crises happening right now. Look at what's happening in Ukraine, what happened in Syria. There's there's so much happening and it's it's us versus you, right? Yes. It's me versus you. It's, it's this country versus that country. And unfortunately, this is a global humanity. You know, we all share the same air. We all share the same water, the oil, um, the same resources. And when one part of the world is hurting, then it reflects on the rest of the world. So that that's stuff that I talk about, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah. But yeah, we need to, we need to come together and but what, have empathy for one another. It sounds to me, you've identified like the root cause to suffering, <laughs> you know, that if there isn't empathy between human beings, that the result will be suffering of some kind. Um, and well, it's the biggest thing that we all have to deal with, which is our own suffering, yeah. and would, whatever way it shows up. But usually it's centered in and around relationships because we are, you know, human beings that need people around us in order to survive. That means relationships have to occur. There may not be intimate relationships. There are other kinds of relationships, as you mentioned, you know, yeah. friendships, work relationships. Yeah. 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 I mean, we had this and it's still going on, you know, with the whole Brexit thing and Europe and, you know, we're in Europe, but we're always, I mean, I'm a Dutchman. So I came from the continent. I prefer to say the continent and England. So, and then, you know, now, and, but people in United Kingdom speak about the continent as Europe. Well, we're a European country, so we're inside Europe. So that's exactly what you say about the division that we have between countries. Yeah, we've, we've really felt that in the last kind of six years. Yeah, no see, I don't know it. much about the Brexit, but I do, I do know what happened. And, uh, yeah. and I can totally see why you guys are identifying differently because mm. you're different now, right? Yeah. And it is, it is now, you know, we're divided. It's, it's the continent versus the UK. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, 100%. And it's the language that some of our leaders use. And they use language like, especially around COVID, it was like, we were the first in Europe to come up with a vaccine. You know, we were the first with this. With, and I'm like, oh, for God's sake, stop showing off. You know, we're all in this together. Just yeah. help your fellow humans. Don't like and, show and off. People don't get that though. There's what, what is it? Almost 8 billion people on this, on this planet. Yeah. And we're exponentially growing. I know that the birth rates are declining in some areas, but in some other areas like third world countries, there's still families having seven, eight, nine children. Yes. But you have to, you have to think even in the United States, there's 300 million people roughly in the U S mm. we're considered a first world country. We still have issues with uh, child abuse, with our foster care system, with human trafficking, with domestic violence, with uh, poverty. You know, right now, gas prices are roughly $5 a gallon in the U.S. Uh, the average median rent in the United States is over $2,000 a month. Median, median. Salary is well under $27,000 a year. Mm. We can't keep going like this. So we're going to see no. even more poverty. Now, that's just the U.S. We're not talking about developing nations like Ghana, like parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East. We're not talking about other countries as well. So if you think that there are 8 billion people on this planet, over 50% of those people are dealing with some kind of poverty. Yeah with abuses you know well and this is probably a very low number I, I think that that number is probably way higher than 50 percent i think so too yeah and i agree you know, the 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 way to fix this is through love and empathy mm. yeah so 
That's what we're fighting for, right, Michael? That's what we're yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I do. <laughs> I mean, it's great that you're traveling the world and appearing on podcasts and speaking about this. Are there some tips that you have how people can get started with this? What are the changes that we can make in order to develop, you know, a better world in that way with love and empathy? So the number one thing we have to remember is we can't change the people around us. We change through influence. So we change ourselves first and then it is reflected and encourages other people to do the same thing. So it's, it's the same thing as, as being in a relationship, romantic relationship or otherwise. You can't try to change your partner. All you can do is change yourself, grow yourself and hope that your growth will then be reflected upon them and encourage them to do the same thing. So the biggest thing we can do is work on ourselves, work on ourselves. Uh, instead of going down the freeway and being angry when we're stuck in traffic and yelling at one another, hold your tongue, work on doing that. You know, something small, work on love. Somebody pisses you off, say something nice. If you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. We, we were taught that growing up, use it. Yeah. And it's all about that, that self-care, right? When you start taking better care of yourself, you'll, you'll start taking better care of the other people around you. And it's that self-talk I was talking about earlier as well. You know, if you, if you like to make fun of yourself, oh, I can't believe I did that again type deal. Mm. Stop doing it. Stop making fun of yourself. Stop putting yourself down. You yeah. are the number one most important person in your life because mm. it is your life. And that's something that we, we as a society, as a humanity, don't realize. We, we do negative self-talk all the time. And now it's time to replace some of those negative words with positive words. And once we start changing, then it, it does change the world around us. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the phrase, be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that rings true. It's never a truer saying, yeah, be the change. It's the hardest thing for human beings to do because it's so much easier to blame someone else for your behavior yeah. and say it's as a result of this or that or the other. And it's, you know, it's the government, it's my partner, it's my mother, it's my father. It's, you know, it's so much easier rather than look in the mirror and go, actually, it's me. I'm the only person. I control what comes out of my mouth, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So something that, that I, I oftentimes talk about as well, which is um, this might trigger some, some of your audience members, but when you're in an abusive situation, the victim, so in my case, it was myself mm. who was the victim and survivor of domestic violence there was a reason why I ended up staying in that relationship for so long. And my responsibility is to accept those reasons as my own. Yes. Now, yes, it happened. And yes, he physically, sexually, emotionally, financially abused me, but I allowed it to happen yeah. for so long. So it's taking that responsibility mm. and that responsibility is so hard when we are constantly blaming other people in our lives. Yeah. So even if we're put into a situation that is not so good, what is our responsibility in that situation? Hmm. What, what is it that we have done to cause us to stay or cause things to get worse, right? So don't blame yourself, don't blame the other people around you, but just responsibility is what is necessary. And then you can see it at face value and go, okay, so I understand that I ended up staying in that abusive relationship because of, you know, I had experienced childhood neglect. I grew up uh, with, a, with a belief system that uh, took me years to overcome. You know, I, I went, I've been through therapy for a long, long time now. I'm a huge advocate and proponent for counseling and therapy. I believe everybody needs to speak to somebody every month at least and you yes. know, get off, you know, things out of your, off your chest. And um, I learned some of the reasons why I ended up staying. 
And that's not blaming my parents. That's not, that's not blaming, you know, my, my, my childhood friends. It's not blaming my, my associates. It's, I, I'm taking responsibility and blame for my portion. And then you move forward. Yes. That's the only way you can move forward. I, yeah, thank you for that. That's, it's really important. And it's, I've listened, it was only, I think last year that I, first started studying the conditioned mind more and more and there were a few speakers one particular one was in the field of buddhism um i'm not i'm not particularly religious but i you know buddhism is if i was religious that would probably be the one that was nearest to me but the concept of you know our conditioned mind is really interesting mm-hmm. And the only way we can become better at recognizing that is to become an observer. This is the hardest thing to do, you know, to almost ha- take yourself out of your out of your body, out of your mind and look down on yourself and go, that's what I'm doing, <laughs> you know, to to kind of almost catch yourself. and. Once I started looking at that, Mike, my own, as you said, work on yourself first, my own conditioned mind, and looking and observing maybe how I was speaking or doing or what I've done in the past, then it's quite enlightening. Let's put it that way. Yeah, for sure. And I know that we don't have too much time left, but uh, I talk a lot about this in our ultimate breakthrough masterclass. Um, I, uh, one of the exercises that I have my clients do is go into a very crowded restaurant or coffee shop or, um, something of the such where they can just sit and listen and, uh, have people start conversations with them without talking back, without talking about yourself, without, um, being negative towards the other people, just listen. And if somebody disagrees with an opinion that you have, I don't care. Listen, don't argue with people, right? And um, and that that's also a reflection on yourself. What you're talking about, you know, stepping out of your comfort zone, looking and seeing what it is that you're doing, mm. and then reflect, you know, and then yes. write about it, reflect. So mm. yeah, quite interesting. So tell me more about your master classes that you yeah. just mentioned. Yeah. No problem. So um, there's a variety of different types of courses that that uh, I offer. Um, I'm also doing a boot camp here in the United States. So the boot camp is October 21st at Clearwater. It's an ultimate breakthrough boot camp. It's all about turning your story into a mission, ministry, movement, nonprofit, or a business. Um, so I help you identify what it is that you're going through, and then help you to realize, capitalize, and monetize on those experiences. And then fun. I believe in a lot of fun. You have to have fun because why else are we here on earth? Um, yes. So degree is all about fun and beach. Uh, but as far as the digital programs that we offer, I've got a, a relationship course that's only $97. We talk a lot about romantic relationships, friendships, work relationships, relationships with yourself, um, family. Did I already say family? And then uh, I, I talk, I dive into a sixth bonus step, which is romantic relationships that are unhealthy. So abusive relationships. Right. Um, right. And I, I also offer an ultimate breakthrough masterclass system, and that's a 10 module system. Um, and then there's an intensive. So you can find all of that information at unsilencemyvoice.com. Again, it's unsilence myvoice.com. I also do one-on-one personalized coaching. Now that is an application process. I cannot take everybody. It has to be a win-win. So we, we need to have a couple of conversations first. And if, if you are willing to work and if I see that I can help you and benefit you, then then we'll join forces. And that's $5,000 per quarter. Right. Yeah. Wow, so again, you do unsilence, you, yeah, unsilencemyvoice.com. Yeah. The, how did that name come about? I, I think the name is brilliant, but how did that come about? 
I'm always intrigued how people come up with names. <laughs> well, uh, the nonprofit name is Unsilenced Voices. Right. So I was actually a bartender when I began Unsilenced Voices. And I remember tossing around names with patrons at the bar. We were just going back and forth. Hey, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And of course, I had to make sure to check everything was available uh, yes. online for the website and everything like that. And um, it just kind of happened. And I am a spiritual person. I um, I believe that that God definitely leads me and uh, definitely not a Bible thumper by any means. But I do believe that we are led. And I feel that unsilenced voices was something that uh, was brought to me. And then unsilence my voice is just a natural spinoff of that for my personal brand and business. Yeah, because it's a really unusual term, isn't it? Unsilence my voice. It's I, I really like it. I think it's very clever. And yeah, it's in, it makes you curious to want to know more, to go, what's that about? How can I? you know, unsilence my voice. <laughs> and it has, it could literally be anything. And I, I love it. Well done. It's really awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. Michelle, how, how, what's the best way? Well, first of all, let me, let me ask a different question before I ask you where they can get in touch is, is there anything that I haven't asked to allow you to share something that you would have liked to have shared that we haven't covered? Uh, you know, we have some key events happening for unsilenced voices happening in the US. Uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff worldwide. We're getting into the NFT space. We have survivors in Sierra Leone, young girls who've now created art pieces. We're turning into NFTs. Wow. Um, we are helping them generate an income by using Web3 technology. So there's a lot of positive things that we're doing. We're getting into the Web3 space. Uh, we have a fundraiser happening next month. So if you are in the US um, or wanting to come to the US, uh, we have a fundraiser in Los Angeles, July 23rd. And um, that fundraiser, we have Lee Steinberg, who is the real life Jerry Maguire. He's the agent to Patrick Mahomes, the Kansas City Chiefs. He is coming and speaking and sharing and it's a uh, open bar and dinner and tray past appetizers and DJ and dancing and silent and live auction. So that event is, is huge. And in order for us to continue the efforts and continue to help, we need funding, right? Yeah. So you can either come to the event and help us that way or donations. And you can always find unsilenced voices at unsilencedvoices.org unsilencedvoices.org so yeah you can find it there. great great thank you for sharing that and um you mentioned jerry Maguire. it's one of my favorite movies of all time and i just love that clip of show me the money it's just the best clip in movie the in movies that i've ever lee seen steinberg that movie was made after lee steinberg so right I'm very, very honored to have lee a part of unsilenced voices Oh, my God. That's brilliant. That's awesome. Great. Anything else? Uh, no, I, I mean, we've got way a ton of other events and I could talk and talk and talk. But again, yeah. there's two websites. So you can go to unsilencemyvoice.com for information about programs and services and unsilencedvoices.org for information about the nonprofit. Brilliant. And they, they can get in touch with you via those websites as well, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. On Unsilence My Voice, you can make an appointment with me um, and uh, we can we can chat about whatever it is that you, you want to chat about. If you are in the UK, make sure to put that in the notes so yes. I can... So I can do a Zoom call instead of a phone call because I like the phone. Uh, Zoom, everybody's kind of Zoomed out these days. So I actually I know. and talk on a telephone. Um, but uh, yeah, you can find all that information out. And then, of course, Michelle Jewsbury, uh, michellejewsbury.com, at Michelle Jewsbury for every social media handle that you can think of. Fantastic. Sounds great. Our conversation's been enlightening. You've, you've really opened my eyes to some things that I wasn't aware, and I'm really grateful to that. I I'm, I'm really have empathy, and I'm sorry that you went through so much rubbish in your early relationships 
but a relationship. But I'm also delighted in some way that it was a gift because it has allowed you to do all of these great things that you're doing now, which may have never happened. So there was a reason for you to have gone through that mm -hmm. because you would not be able to do this work with empathy for other you know, survivors and victims out there. So I'm really grateful to you for being, having gone on that journey to help other people. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me. And well, let's keep in touch. I'd, I'd like to follow you and all the great things that you're doing. And if you're ever in the UK, do let me know and we can hook up for a, a lunch or something. Um, that will be awesome. I'd like that. Take care. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests. So do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.